told her for Sandy to take more time. Let's turn again to Philippians <clears throat> chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 again. We're going to read verse 1. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, and we're, just, we're not really going to get past verse 1, but we'll read the first four verses anyways. Paul says, If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Now that's, that's really the main verb of those couple of verses there. By being of of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness and empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So I pray that God will bless what we've been listening to in the reading of this passage. I, I know that what I'm going to try and share with you, what I've enjoyed from this, and which really has slapped me upside the head, I'll be able to share it in a way that will be an encouragement. Even though sometimes when I look at some of the things I've typed on in my notes, it doesn't really encourage me. But I hope it's an encouragement. And we've been looking at this from the standpoint of Paul writing to these Christians. And as we mentioned before, they were an encouraging group to him. And we don't have to go back over that ground, but... I uh, was sitting there, as Sandy was speaking, I was looking at some of these verses again, and I, and I just look at it this way. In chapter 1, Paul says something. He says, I thank my God on all of my remembrances of you. Huh? Think about that. Do I thank God every time I think about you? Huh? I can reverse that, right? I see a lot of smirks. See? So I, I, really, for this man in prison, probably doing without a lot of things, he actually was writing to this group of people, and one of the first things he says is, every time I think of you, I thank God. Wow. He's, he is heading to our subject that we're dealing with on the one mind, the one spirit, one mind, the unity of the spirit, the unity of of a fellowship of believers. <laughs> and every time he thinks about them, he's happy for them. That's pretty good, huh? He says, uh, in verse 4, he says, Every time I pray for you, it is with joy. Sometimes we think of somebody, and we even pray for them. Never mind pray for them with joy, right? Now, you could keep going on in this vein of thinking, but I won't continue in that. But Paul was thrilled with the Christians that were there in this Roman colony in Philippi. He really was. He, was. he was taken up by all that they had been taken up with, and he was thrilled with all that they had been uh, coming to the good of, really been thrilled. All of his thoughts about them were positive thoughts. I've enjoyed that, going through this, and, and trying to dissect some of the words and trying to find something in it about Paul, like, you know, pulling out the proverbial billy club. It never happened. They, uh, they most likely have quality leaders in this fellowship. That comes to us in the first couple of verses of chapter 1. They hadn't gone astray, that you can really find that there's no theology that they had wandered away from, like other places. There was no gross immorality going on in the fellowship that he had to scold them for and, and correct them on. There was, they're just a great bunch. They're a great bunch of Christians. I hope you don't mind me saying this. It's kind of silly, but I'm driving down the road coming in here, and I, my mind went back to 2001 when we rented the Kiski camp. And Seed Sower took the place, 151 of us, I think, were registered in that camp. And I don't know if some of you all remember, but the first time we went into the tabernacle, <laughs> the back room with all the benches that we spoke from there was called the tabernacle. And the first time we went in there and creaked open those doors and turned on the lights, I don't know if you all remember, but there was a lot of screaming going on because 
right down the main lane of the benches, we saw some molted skins from serpents. And some of the girls went this way around the, some of those benches, and there was a scream, and we saw the slithering tail of a black snake. Shoo, what a six-footer. Big fat thing. He was probably enjoying all the mice in that building. And well, that's what I thought of. Paul is writing to these Christians, and though there's so much good going on, they had great thoughts towards him. He had great thoughts toward them, and back and forth it went great bunch. But there was this ugly, slimy serpent, this snake, that kept popping its head up. If you've ever been swimming in Florida, I don't recommend it. When I was a kid, my grandfather had a piece of land in Orlando, and uh, we went down to the lake to swim. And we no sooner got in the water, my mother screamed. She says, get out. And I didn't know. She said, look. And we looked across the water, and not too far from us, these little heads were up. Water moccasins. And she told us this horrible story, and we never wanted to go back to that lake. They popped their head up. They and so I want to just try and uh, touch on this aspect. He is, he is wanting to express to these dear Christians, in all of his expressions of joy, and in the midst of all this, and he's really, he really bookends the letter with this. He wants them to understand, as we looked at in verse 27, and we mentioned in chapter 4, and he, mentioned, he mentions to every fellowship of believers that he writes to, this ugly, horrible thing called disunity or discord. Um, he wanted them to stand firm. We looked at that aspect, and this is, a, this is his great plea, and every time he writes them, he, he, he brings this out, every group. And I'm, I'm just I'm bouncing through some of the, the things I have written here for the sake of time because I really want to get to the four reasons, the four things here. You see, I really think that what Paul is getting at here, and I want to try and illustrate this for you, and you'll have to pardon those that are here from a keys port one Sunday morning three or four weeks ago at the close of breaking the bread for like three minutes. I used this as an illustration. I'm going to use it again because it came to me in something that I saw as a kid. The apostle was trying to get something across to these believers, and I want to try and get this across to us today from the Word of God. When Paul wrote to them, and he has introduced this subject of what it means to be of one spirit and of one mind, and if, he, and if we were to borrow from Ephesians 4, where he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We might touch on that again in a few minutes, what that word is actually used here, the verb that is used. When he writes them this, he wants them to understand something, that this is, this is not an outside, forced upon unity. This is an inward thing. And I think the, uh, the best way I can probably describe it, and I was sitting there reading this, it's, three or four weeks ago now, and I'm going over my mind, and here's what came to my mind. When my siblings all went off to school, I was, for a year or two there, I was home with my mother, and we would often go down to the local, we had a Murphy's Fruit Mart in town, the old-fashioned fa old store with the creaky wood floors, and I used to love going through the town, and there was a Woolworth there, and I said this, and it was a cool Woolworth, and it was the old-fashioned one, and uh, I like to go to the toy section, it's a very, it's a small little store, and on this toy section, they had marbles. And I knew I could buy them because they were dirt cheap. Marbles in a cloth mesh bag. And I could pick them up and look at them. And these ones had red or these ones had blue in it, you know. And I think it was a quarter or something. You buy this little bag of marbles. And you could bring them home. And, you know, if you grab that bag of marbles the wrong way and the little cloth high on the top wasn't just so, and you just reach over and grab it, all the marbles went everywhere. Right? Here's what came to me. The apostle wanted them to understand something. That they were not dealing with this subject because of the container they were in in Philippi. You got the picture? He didn't want them to be like glass marbles that were being held together by this mesh bag. And if it was just the wrong little thing came along and, along and something just cut the wrong cord, bam, they all scattered. He wanted them to understand that unity wasn't out here pushing us all together. Instead, when I got to grade 8, I had a biology teacher. I think it was biology. <laughs> he must have made a big impression. 
But I remember one day, he pulled a bowl out and he put it on the counter and I wanted what was in that bowl because I had a slingshot. And in that bowl were steel ball bearings. They weren't big ones, they were a little bigger than BBs. And I, could, I looked at them and I thought, boy, they'd fit in the leather pouch of my wrist rocket and I could really put some damage on something. And I remember looking at that bowl and he pulled out of the box this big, strong magnet that came from an old-fashioned speaker, whatever he was illustrating, I don't know, but this is what he did. He took that magnet and he held it up here, and as he got closer to the, the ball bearings, there was some shaking, and he plunged it into the bowl. And he shook it around a little bit, and then he pulled out his hand, and there was not one ball bearing left in the bowl. And we sat there and looked, and there's him holding the magnet, and here's all these steel ball bearings, and they're all stuck. He said, what are you getting at? When Paul wrote to this group of believers, and when he starts out by saying, if there be any encouragement in Christ, and goes on and on and on with the four things we're going to look at in verse 1, he is trying to get across this. I want you to know something, he says. By being of the same, this is the verse, by being of the same might, he wanted us to be marbles in a bag. He wanted to be the steel ball bearings who were being pulled to each other by the force that was pulling them together, which is Christ. Now, I know it's a homely, homely illustration, but I wonder if we can understand for a few minutes something here today. When the apostle writes, guided and led by the Spirit of God, with the most intimate of words he's about to use, when he starts out this paragraph, and it's almost, it's almost sad that we have to have the word if. Because, and I remember we took this for an hour with the folks out west who had difficulty with the English language in itself. And they had great difficulty with understanding the ifs of the New Testament. And so we pulled it up, and we pulled some stuff up on the screens, and we showed them that in the original language there's ifs of condition. It's a conditional if. And without going into all the details, it doesn't matter. This is the first class conditional. And it's not that he's saying, yeah, he's a, it's an if and it's true. Let's, let's leave it at that. And so he's basically saying, because he's given them the incentives. And I want to try and convey in the next few minutes this. We have every scriptural, biblical, Christ-centered incentive to strive for unity in the fellowship of believers. And the four that the Apostle Paul gives us here are so powerful He's always told about what it means to stand firm in one spirit, in one mind, striving together. He's taken the military term, the familial term, and the athletic term. He said, here you are. He said, get it together, man, and let's strive. Let's be focused on the goal before us. That which is so important and so integral to the heart and mind of Christ's unity. To not have it displays a selfish attitude amongst everyone in a fellowship, especially me. You say, why is that? Because what he is going to say is because. These four things are my incentive. The word endeavor I enjoy in Ephesians 4, and we won't have the time to go back and forth to some of the things that we could in Ephesians. But in Ephesians 4, when the, the apostle says, endeavor, he says, it's, uh, I kinda, it, it caught my attention because when I was clicking on it and looking up the original words, it's, it actually was a name of a principal I had in high school. Spadazzo. That's, that's how you say it. I mean, hey, that's my principal. And it's a, it's a verb that, that the apostle used, and it simply means this. He says, I want you to make every constant effort. So here's the Christians in the city of Ephesus. He's writing to them from the same prison. And here's the Christians in Philippi. And he said, if you could just endeavor, make every constant effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, the blessing that will come from that could never be calculated. But the loss that can come from the other side it can never be calculated either. So he starts out, and it really, we're going to take the next few minutes, and I want, I want us to notice why we should. Why we should, as believers that are connected to each other in a local fellowship, in different 
uh, fellowships that are represented here today. Why? Why should we pursue this? Why not just do what we've been hearing and go away somewhere and sulk in the madness of my whatever? Why? Well, so let's, let's, let's take a look at it. There's four of them, and the first one is, uh, is pretty simple, but I want you to understand something. They are all in light of the verb that is present, being of the same mind, right? That, that's what's in light of. He's working towards that. That's what's pulling. So let's look at verse 1 here. And he says, uh, because. Because there is encouragement. And I hope that the if doesn't show you a, a little bit of a curve. It, it used to bother me until I understood that he's actually saying, in some of the your versions you might read, say, since there is encouragement. Or because there is. And so he says, because it, this is the inspiration. Because there is. Now, it's very simple. The word that is used, which I, I, I can't, I'm not going to pronounce the word, but if I said it, you might know it. Some of us might know it. But it's the word that is used for this. I come up to you and I put my arm around you and I come alongside you. I say, let, let me help you over this. Right? That's the word. To come alongside. And what he's saying is this. He says, in your life there is Philippi. It's almost as if he, was, if he could paraphrase, he would have said, I was there, Mr. Jailer, the moment you burst into that inner prison, and the moment you dropped on your knees trembling with a torch in hand and said, what must I do to be saved? I was there the moment you got encouragement from Christ. That's what happened. That's what he's saying here. The moment when God by his spirit showed you that your deepest need, when you held up the sword and would have killed yourself, and you heard, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Cultural light springs in, comes trembling, falls down. And in those moments, you understood that as you all step out into eternity without the Savior that these beaten and bleeding men are singing about, that moment, you got the deepest encouragement from Christ himself. And because you did, you have been eternally linked with him. And because his heart is that you should be united to all other believers like a magnet in your midst, pulling you to one another through himself, why wouldn't we want to give back to God what he so desires? Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it rang a bell in my empty head. It rang a bell. It's simply this. Paul just he said, hey, he said, hey, because there is encouragement, because there is the coming alongside, the constant encouragement and exhortation and all the counsel, everything that we receive from Christ every day of our lives, Paul said, because of that, be of the same mind. <laughs> it, it's, it's touching. That's just the first one. It was... Uh, he wanted them to understand that the influence of the Lord Jesus on their life, not too long before, the influence of Christ on their life should be the motivating factor to be in harmony with one another. I, uh, I, I looked at this, and here's how it appealed to me, and I hope you can, can try and catch this. There's a principle here. We won't have time to go into it all, but there's a principle that says this throughout the Word of God, especially in Romans chapter 8. The moment God saved me, when I look back to a cool November night in 1969, when as a boy of almost 10, I found out that that Savior that died there on that cross was no less than God's Son, the Lord Jesus, and he died for this ungodly sinner. Thank you. That moment when the Spirit of God took up residency, I got the greatest encouragement from Christ that it could have ever gotten, and I entered into a relationship. Did you catch that? I entered into a relationship. And when I sin, now I'm going to back up now and say this, because I believe what he's getting at here by virtue of what he says is that when I take my attitude of disunity or discord and I bring it into a fellowship of believers, and I know that it's against the heart and mind of Christ and the Spirit of God. We're going to see that in these four things. When and if I do that, I am actually sinning against, not you, maybe, 
Not the elders, maybe, but I'm sinning against the relationship. Wow. When, when I see that, it, it puts it in a different light. I have, I have been, you have been made an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Everything that is His is yours and going to be. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to think. Uh, I want to move quickly to, to the next one because they're connected. So he says, because there is encouragement in Christ, there's much more that could be said on that. He goes further and he says, and this is connected to it because the first one, he introduces the Lord Jesus and he ties it into it. He says, because there is consolation of love. And these are, I really like this. This is two great words. And they're so connected with the moment we came to know him and the continuing aspect of the encouragement of Christ in your life. Let me just stop and ask you a question. This is such a rhetorical question. Have you ever, since the day God saved you, have you ever been encouraged in Christ? Yeah, I just saw a couple eyes go, well, of course. We don't know the half. We don't know the half. And when he moves from that, that clause, that phrase, because there is encouragement in Christ, and he goes like this, because there is consolation of love. Now this word for consolation is a very interesting word. And again, I'm not going to try and pronounce it to you, but one of the, the interlinears that I used with the two lines, and I clicked on it, and I never saw it before. You know what it says? He says, this word means gentle cheering. Did you catch that? Now, we know what it means to stand on the sidelines and go, hey, you know, you're cheering. Your, your son or your grandson runs by, they're playing soccer, and he just made this great steal. He's a, he scored a goal. And you're like, woo! You know, you're, like, you're cheering. Right? That's not just the idea. The idea is this. The word consolation is connected with the next word, agape. And it's the word gentle cheering of love. And it's this thing. It's the idea that he's still coming alongside. And the word means this. He's whispering in your ear gentle cheering. It's always used in the New Testament in a friendly way, and it's always used in a way that is intimate. Have you ever had those moments? And like we've been hearing, you're about to slip off the edge of discouragement. And like the apples of gold in pitchers of silver, there's a word fitly spoken, especially from the Word of God. And you're encouraged. You ever been sitting somewhere and the, 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 the circumstances of life have got you so low to a point you just lift up your heart without words and tell God, I can't take any more. And what does he do? He whispers in your ear. I can tell you it's true. And I'll never forget when it was almost like hearing the voice of God when he just whispered into my ear, not really, but you know what I mean, just came to me. Oh, wow. Thank you. And a scripture comes to mind. Are you following this at all? To think that Paul is writing this much, he wants them to understand something. Because there is incarnate in Christ. Because this one who came alongside you and saved you from a pit going down in your sin, he said, you've known it daily. He said, well, I want to tell you to go deeper. There's, there's the consolation of the one who comes alongside and whispers gentle cheering in your ear, and they're only words of tender mercy, love. What an incentive to look at the Christian next to me, to look at the believer in front of me, or the one that I'm not rubbing shoulders with, I'm just rubbing with. And tempers are one in the flare, and words are almost spoken without being spoken. And as old Sidney Maxwell used to say, and Frank Piercy, the air is blue and you can almost cut it with a knife. You know what I'm talking about. I do. The incentive for Christians in a locality to strive together 
being of one spirit and one mind, to conduct them to be of the same mind as we see here, is because there's encouragement in Christ and because there's consolation of love. That, that, that to me, speaks volumes. And much more could be said on that. You know, when I, when I think of this, this aspect of... It, it's really bothersome in the sense that whenever this slips into my weak, failing mind, whenever something is dropped as a bomb by words or email or text, or something is done or said, maybe inadvertently, and I take it the wrong way, and something in my attitude, that's what it really is, begins to well up, and something just wants to, to lash out and turn back one of those faces, you know? You all, young people, know what that means. I just had to upgrade my phone because the last one burned out on me. I said to my wife, what is this? And she said, well, that's, you just push that button there and you get a face. And so I texted her one. She said, don't send me that face. I'm all like this, you know? Yeah, yeah. We have no clue how we can deal with different individuals on different levels. The next thing you know, we've sent someone into a despondent thought process. When I do that, or when I... What's the word I'm thinking of? When I foster an attitude of discord or disunity amongst any group of believers or even a small group, I am affecting grossly horribly and displaying an attitude of ingratitude towards one who has done everything for my good. It's a relationship. You know, you know what came to me? What came to me to, to show it really clear was this. You know, look at, think of King David for a minute. Like, now just think about this. King David sinned against Bathsheba. Right? He did. He sinned against his own wife. He sinned against her husband. He killed him. He sinned against the people he was ruling over. He sinned against the law of God. But when David cried out to God, what did he say? He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. You see, he took it in the right spot. When I sow, well, I tell you what, I was mentioning this in the break to someone. It's so powerful. When you go through the, the Old Testament and the New, and you start to see the theme that weaves through, and God looks down and he says, and the proper writer writes this, he says, These six things the Lord hates, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him. And he starts with the problem of, where's the end? Where's the end? Discord among the brethren, those that sow it. Wow, I tell you, this is powerful. So, in my thinking, in our understanding of this scripture, we've got to take it at face value. When the Apostle Paul was writing them, he wanted them to understand something. Because he was positive, man. This is clear. He wasn't pulling out the proverbial apostolic Philly club and clobbering them. He wasn't going to Corinth and pulling out the wrong. This was a good church, to use that term. This was a good bunch of called out people from a Roman system to God. And something had lit its slimy head. Discord. He said, I want you to know the four incentives why we should seek unity. Because there is encouragement in Christ and because there is a gentle, gentle cheering and the coming alongside and a whispering in the ear of tender love from Christ himself. And he goes further. The next one is this. He says, because there is fellowship of the Spirit. I had a tough time with this one. And the more time I spent on it, the deeper it got. And you prop somebody. Could take an hour on this. I couldn't. But I enjoyed this. He says, I want you to understand something. He says, we have just looked. He says, take a look at the love of Christ. Take a look at it. The man who was locked in prison for years spent time inscribing in the wall. He said, the love of God is greater than the tongue of pen. Could ever span, right? It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest land. And we know the hymn, and we sing it. Powerful. He understood in the prison cell the love of God. We'll spend eternity never understanding it. Paul says, because of encouragement in Christ, because of consolation and love, because of his gentle cheering, he says, oh, hang on, he says, because of the fellowship of the Spirit. So I want to ask you, young Christian here today, have you ever thought, 
of what the Spirit of God has done for you? Have I ever given it consideration? Have I ever sat down and just gone through and made a list of what it is that the Spirit of God... And now, this is very unique words. Because when he says fellowship, it's the word without saying it. It's the word that means partnership. There's a communion with the Spirit of God. There's a sharing. And to think that God the Spirit actually wants to have fellowship with me and you. He says, because of that, the Holy Spirit, he says, it brought about a regeneration. We were dead, destitute, down in our sin. And he came and lifted me up out of a horrible pit and out of a miry clay. Right? He, he's the one who gave me regeneration. He's the one who said, you have become my temple. A temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians chapter 6. He says, I'll seal you. Ephesians 1. Sealed by the Spirit of God. He goes on to say this. He says, uh, Paul says he's become the guarantor, the guarantor of our eternal inheritance. He's enabled us and empowered us for service. He's, each one of us has been gifted by the Spirit. He goes on to say, we've been continually and we are continually cleansed by the Spirit. The Spirit in Romans is always praying for us with words, human words that can't be uttered in a language only the Trinity understands. Every day, constantly, He's praying for me. So go ahead. The Holy Spirit is affecting our sanctification. The Holy Spirit is guaranteeing our eternal glory. He's filling us daily. He's producing fruit in us. He's teaching us. He's enabling us to resist temptation. The Holy Spirit has given us the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit really has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And dare I bring disunity and discord into a fellowship of believers and destroy that which is so important to the heart of God, the heart of Christ, and the Spirit of God. Because there is fellowship of the Spirit. Whew. I, I almost need to step back and look at these scriptures and say, wow, wow. He goes on further and he says, because there is affection and compassion. He really is, he's plunging quite a bit deeper. The words that he's using here for affection are, to, to try and explain it from their standpoint is a little bit difficult, but it's the, the actual word is the word for bowels, gut. It doesn't mean this gut. It means where the seat of emotion, affection was. And he says, because of affection. And he's basically saying this, because it's, it's tied to the fellowship of the Spirit. The Spirit of God wants to have partnership with you and me. He wants to have fellowship with you and me. He's done it from day one. From the moment we see in Scripture that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, from that day till now, He is moving in the heart of you and me to bring us closer to the Lord Jesus. And He says, because of fellowship with the Spirit and because of affection, that word is a longing. Did you know that the Spirit of God has a deep longing? Longing for you. Did you ever think about that? Sometimes, I, I think we think, well, I used to, especially when I was younger, and even so now we're fogged, you know, we, we think that the Spirit of God is not a person. He is. Sometimes we think that the Spirit of God, and we say this reverently, is some kind of a holy vehicle that throws us good things now and then. <gasps> because there is fellowship of the Spirit. Because there is affection. There is this longing. He is, he is longing. For me and you to spend time with the Word of God so the Spirit of God can point us to the Son of God who points us to God that we might be in fellowship with God. And when I turn to you and I speak words of disunity and discord, I am offending. I am sinning against the Spirit. I tell you, it's, it's, it's powerful. But he goes on and says this, because there is affection and compassion. And the word compassion goes a little deeper. It really is, and the few times that it's found in Scripture, it's the tender mercies of God. It's, it's beautiful. And Paul says it many times. He says, uh, the tender mercies of God. If I, have, if I have received and I have, right, the longings of the Spirit and the tender, compassionate sympathy of God through the Spirit, 
and God has been, he's been sympathetic to me, he's been sympathetic to you, and I, I look at the different meanings to some of these words, and I think of how God has had such great, tender pity on each one of us, and by the Spirit his desire for fellowship and compassion and affection and this tender mercy. When I look at all of this, can I look square into my fellow believer's eye? and say with words audible or inaudible, I do not want to be in harmony with you. Do I want to stand back and take from God all that he gives through the Lord Jesus and through the, the Spirit of God and not want to give back to him that which his heart so desires? You know, I, in, in looking at this subject, it's very... Uh, It's, it's very sad. And you say, well, why do you say that? Because it's everywhere. Every, I cannot get over it. I don't know of a group of believers anywhere that I know of that is not being horribly affected in some way with a spirit of disunity. We don't know where it comes from. You know, it's not like heresy. When heresy comes along and lifts its ugly head, you can hear it, you can see it, you can squash it, hopefully. It's not like some other great sin that comes along that Paul saw in Corinth and heard from the house of Chloe, and he wrote direct things to counter it. And of course, the answer to every one of them was the person of Christ. But this, this is this internal, insidious, infectious thing that works like a snake, and you find out there's a whole nest of them. I look at the clock, I was going to tell you a story about that, but I won't. But I ran across a whole nest of rattlesnakes when we lived out west. And along came these guys. They said, we deal with them all the time. And they walked in there with boulders, and they just crushed their heads. Just kept crushing them. And all the little babies came out, they just crushed them. It was, I mean, there was, it was a den of rattlesnakes. They thought nothing of it. They dealt with it all the time. We had one that was curled up right on our porch. And I, I could hear it over the engine of my car with the wind blows with the air running. His tail was up. I mean, it was so loud. And I thought to myself, that's what it's like. Is this something new? <laughs> it's as old as the Garden of Eden. Do you think for one minute we can beat it as believers dealing with one another? Do you think we can beat it in our flesh? Not a chance. The last thing Paul says here, and we'll just close with this. I want to end exactly at 525, so I have one and a half minutes. And I would like to, tomorrow afternoon, take up what it actually is. It's interesting how Paul comes out and says, here's why we should have unity in the fellowship as our incentive. And then he tells them what it is. The last thing Paul says is this. Oh, by the way, he says, make my joy complete. You know what that tells me? It tells me simply that, this is how I took it. I'm not sure if, when we get to heaven, we'll have to ask, ask Paul. He's simply saying this. I was the first one there. I introduced you to the Lord Jesus. You responded. And by the time we left, it was a fellowship of believers, and now I'm writing you from prison. He said, as I write you as your first leader, and as I'm writing you, I'm writing to your leaders, first couple of verses. He said, I want you to know something. It would make their joy. Complete. You only have to go to Hebrews 13 and read it for yourself. It gives great joy to leaders amongst God's people locally to know it. And we, we see it in, in, when John writes, he says, What a great thing to know my children walking through. It brings joy. John Paul says, Make my joy complete by, here's the verb, being of the same mind. Unity in a fellowship of believers is an absolute must. Unity amongst Christians locally. Our incentive for it is because there's encouragement in Christ. Because there is consolation and love. His gentle cheering. His agape love that seeks the highest, highest love for our good. Because there is fellowship of the Spirit. Because there is his affection, his longing, and his tender mercies and compassion. <sighs> Fulfill my joy, he says, by being of the same mind. And then he goes on to say what it actually is. And if you're here tomorrow, we hope that he will share that with you. And may God bless it.